So from an Indian speaker, we turn to a Colombian speaker. And we now have Carolina Botero. Carolina uh, is a lawyer, researcher, an activist from Colombia, co-leader of Creative Commons in Colombia, part of the Charisma uh, Foundation. And she's going to give us uh, a good inside view from the Colombian perspective, uh, the, the region on itself, but especially on, on Colombia, Legeras, and so on. Let me just get you the remote control. And is it, is it good go? Okay, so... Can I have that one? That one scares me. Uh, okay, go Thank ahead. You. Thank you very much. Uh, so I wanted to give us, Carlos said, a first perspective from Latin America. And of course, um, I think all the activists in Latin America will first identify themselves with Mafalda, because Mafalda doesn't like SOPA. Uh, if you don't know about this, I can't explain it right now, but please ask somebody from Latin America aside of you. Uh, so, I'm talking from Latin America, and I would like to start by saying three examples very briefly of what you might know about this relation between activism and positive agenda. The first one will be Chile. They had like three years of discussions with a very successful engagement of civil society that end up in a, a strong copyright reform, probably not the best, but a very good possible one. Uh, the second one will be Mexico. Uh, the struggle they did with ACTA and how they managed to uh, get m the Congress to stop ACTA signing was another very good example and of course Brazil with Marco Civil. So these are like the three good examples we have in the region with this kind of ties. Uh, and of course I'm not coming from but from Colombia. Of those who do, of you who know a little bit of Latin American politics especially in copyright might know that Colombia probably along with Argentina are the copyright talibans of the region. We have a very strong copyright school, uh, a very traditional one, and that has been enforced into the state, let's say. We are, they, they have strong ties, that means that uh, all our legislation and so on is being kind of a model of uh, copyright tradition. In this frame, I was asked to talk about 2012, but it is impossible to speak about 2012 without going a little bit behind and talking about 2011. And I would also like to frame it into the second half of 2011. And this is when Leigeras happened. Leigeras uh, was a government initiative, a draft law presented before the parliament that specifically addressed the issue of ISP responsibility. It just stated a procedure for a notice and takedown system, just like the DMCA one, but with a lot of loopholes. Like, for instance, there were 72 hours to take down the, the content that was meant to be infringing, and then there was a procedural time of uh, good faith time for it to go up back again. There was no time frame. So anyway, there were lots of loopholes, but I, I will just point out kind of the political frame of that. The first one will be, why was it called Leigeras? It was before, um, on behalf, sorry, of Vargas Lleras. It's really, his two last names was, like in the Spanish tradition, Vargas Lleras. He, is the, he was the Minister of Interior. That's another thing in Colombia, copyright office, or the copyright issues are not in the cultural minister, or in the educational minister, or in the communication min no, in the interior minister. That's another nice story about dictatorship about 50 years ago. I can tell you about that later. But anyway, he was the minister of interior at the moment, and it was called not Ley Vargas because his second last name comes from his great-great-great-great-father, who was once the president of Colombia, and he was a very liberal person and a very important politician of 20th century in Colombia. So it was a very political thing to point it as Lleras, not as Vargas. So Lleras was on behalf of him who presented it as a very good initiative against piracy. But the point is, he was talking about piracy like in the traditional discourse, but speaking to people, to young people, on the social networks. So he was saying something and people was listening another and there was other things happening on. So in this kind of communication loops, we had really a law that was an FTA imposition. It was, there was no information on other options. It was presented like a one size fit all. 
while in the world we knew that Chile, Canada, Australia, many others had taken different ways. Even if you have a notice and take down, you have also Europeans having different ways of doing it. You have the French way, the Spanish way, so the UK way. So, but here it was presented like FTA says we have to do this. And of course it was associated to the enforcement agenda that was driven by the FTAs and issues of due process, privacy, um, freedom of expression was taken to the floor. We started pointing out that the same FTA was providing that you, sh you have to implement the FTA in the means of the frame of your country. It says that the parties understand that procedures and remedies set forth in these articles for enforcement of intellectual property rights are established in accordance with the principles of due process that each party recognizes and the foundation of its own legal system. And we should recognize also that in Latin America there is a strong freedom of expression frame inside the, the Inter-American Court of Justice. So all this was set forth and it really went through. How did we do it? It was a network. Uh, from Charisma, we, start, we, we push it, but we had a lot of free software, especially uh, institutions and individuals. And then some artists came into the network too, and individuals, librarians, educators, many, many people. So we started working like a network and pushing it. We went to the Congress, we did a streaming of every David, we started to talk into the um, uh, broadcast and we, we managed to move the media into the discourse and by doing this the impression of the people like that they were going to be searched through the computer and so on it managed to stop the law like politicians felt that it was not favorable into the society and the law was I don't know if that's the right word in English but it was archived was put behind and they said they will present it later. This happened during 2011. We believe that these are the main reasons that make the, the law to stop. Vargas Lleras will be a president one day of Col in Colombia and he just thought that was not a good presentation card there. Uh, he managed, we managed to raise awareness about other rights and how to use them into the digital world. There were enough people, because right now Colombia is reaching about 50% of internet penetration. So it was a good moment to talk about people using internet and people that felt there was something strange there. We should recognize anyway that it was a netizen initiative and it was very centered and that has to change for the future. But it's true, it was like that at the moment. So in, what happened in 2012? Here I want you to point out to this specific time frame, which is March 19 to April 13. And just think that Colombia is a Catholic country. For us, the Holy Week is very important because we all go on holidays. So the Holy Week is in there. So really, there are just few working days there. But there was a draft law that was presented into Congress the 19th of March. And it managed to go through all the process in 20 days. It was fast-tracked and it became Law 1520 and it was called Leyeras 2.0. Uh, Leyeras 2.0 was a copyright reform. It includes a lot of things like uh, anti-circumvention provisions, it tigers the um, uh, criminal sanctions, it talks about the time uh, it extended the time protection, so it's really a huge thing. But it went through into in 20 days with Holy Week inside. Why? Because President Obama was coming to Cartagena to the uh, Ibero-American meeting with other presidents, and our president, who is Juan Manuel Santos, wanted to give him a gift. We had to comply with all the necessary requirements for the FTA. After five years of of doing all the paperwork for FTA, we didn't have this because of two issues. We haven't done all the homework with IP issues and something in labor law that was already fixed. So this was the last part that needed to be done. The notice and takedown had one more year after the, after the FTA comes into place, but all the other issues like the time protection extension, like uh, anti-circumvention measures, uh, specific issues, etc., had to be fixed 
to, in order for Colombia to have the FTA. The pressure inside Colombia was strong, so they put the, the law into Congress and it was, to meant, it was meant to go through in one week. We managed to push it for 20 days. Again, the frame was the same one. FTA imposition, no information, it was presented as a one-size-fits-all, it's the same. But we didn't have this time, even the time, to ask for a debate. It was a machine. All the political, the, the government has the majority and they order the political parties to do it, as we call it, in popitrazo. It would be just yes. There was no chance to do anything. So what we did, we called out for the network. We were working for, few, uh, for a couple of years now. Especially, we did have to thank the support of the Limitations and Exceptions Network, especially Michael Carroll, Peter Jatsi, and Sean, that in a weekend draft a letter raising up the concerns of this, of this draft and push it into the network. And we got 80 activists, but especially professors, signing the letter. So in the last debate, all there was going to be, foie, we had the letter to show and tell them, these are professors. These are even professors from our commercial partner. They are saying there are issues here. You can't just push more and more. You have to balance explain the need of balance. That was the key issue of the letter. So we managed to get some MP to raise questions there. As a debate that was going to be, yes, was for six hours until midnight. We get a, an MP to put proposals over it, and they were forced to listen at him, even if every time he finished, they would say, we approve the other one. But it was six hours and streaming in both. It was a very nice political exercise anyway. We knew we were defeated, but we managed to speak. So uh, next thing interesting happened was that because of this, we were uh, proposed to bring somebody to the May 31 Rights Con Conference here in Rio. And they proposed to take the senator, that senator that supported us and brought some things to the, to, the, to the plenary when the debate was in Congress. He couldn't come because he was about to have a baby at the same day, so he said no. But I asked the people, the right con, don't lose this chance. Why don't we bring somebody who was against that since the beginning? Why? Because he was one of the ones who proposed, who was speaking in favor of Leje as one, but moreover, Anonymous came and put down all his web page, all his information, everything. So he was really, really pissed off with Anonymous. And at the moment, I was meant to be the head of Anonymous in Colombia. So he was not really glad with us, but because of the debate, at the end, he, even, he stopped saying things. Kind of he thought, there's something strange here. I had always here only one side, and I've not been here the other part. So he had a very good assistant who was reading and so on, and he said, there's something strange here. So we brought Juan Manuel Galán, one of the main senators in one of the important parties in Colombia. If somebody knows something about Colombia, he's the son of the candidate that in the 80s was killed by Pablo Escobar and all those issues. So he was kind of an important person in Colombia, and he came with me to the right con. A amazing thing happened. When we went back home in the plane, he said, I'm not with you, but now I understand you. Which was something really, really good. Now we have somebody in there who's starting to think on digital rights, on how do you manage rights in the digital time. So June 13, this is another good point. Michael Carl came to Colombia, and he came to explain the positive agenda. And we had him talking with the copyright office man in the left. You can see how amazed he was in the, re in the meeting. And other people. To the right, you have one of the most um, active persons from the visually impaired community. He's uh, blind himself. And he has been, for many years, pushing the agenda of exceptional limitation for visually impaired people. And he said, it's the first time in four years that I managed to be in a public space with the Copyright Office. They have never let me talk. So it was very good. At the end, this is something from a blog. The government has no 
legislative agenda for exceptions and limitations. It was amazing. I mean, we had a lot of arguments. The government has none. They just couldn't explain anything. So July 20, despite the fact that the government has no agenda for exceptions and limitation, draft law 001, so the first draft law presented in the new legislative process was exceptions and limitations. The government, through an MP, presented an, a bill of exceptions and limitations about temporary copies, visually impaired people, libraries, parody, and education. They had one month before no agenda, but suddenly presented this bill. It, it is full of good intentions. At least we're talking about exceptions and limitations, but the proposal is full of misunderstanding. It just gives you kind of the carrot, you know? It's very bad. So 2012, October 9, we, somebody tell us there's going to be a meeting with this bill, but it's private. You need invitation. And we said, well, we called the visually impaired. They were invited. And uh, we said, well, Carolina Botero wants to go. And they said, no, no, press cannot come. And I was like, press? I'm a lawyer. No, no, press cannot come because I have a co an opinion column in a, in a newspaper. So I told one of my colleagues in the foundation, you go with them. They won't recognize you. They will let you in. And she went. She got into the meeting. And the copyright office director did recognize her. And once she was in, he was like, done. They are done. And they were done. Because the MPs that were there, they, none of them knew that there were constraints against it, that they were public, they were on the website, and so on. Because of that, we got into a November 20th public forum about this copyright law, and the University of Rosario gave us the, the place, and we managed to put in librarians, everybody to talk. Like 20 people went there and spoke out about this at the point that we got the National Archive and the National Library to send a letter saying they, were, they did not agree with this uh, draft law. December 5, we got approved <laughs> the draft law 001, but it has changed a lot. Still is not good, but we managed to change a lot of it. But there's another good thing. On December 5th, the Senate presented another draft law. It's 138. It's an access to knowledge for visually impaired people, and it's been presented by Senator Galan that sat down with all the visually impaired community and draft a law. So I think this is kind of a good thing of events that happened during 2012, and we managed to change this kind of general frame into another one. There are two draft laws right now speaking about exceptions and limitations, something that hasn't been talked about in Colombia for years. There is one pending draft law on ISP still that it has to be done before May. So we are <laughs> thinking that there will be another fast track. Uh, we know that we are a netizen community, but we need to push forward to get more people involved, teachers, librarians, and so on. And um, there is something good also because of the law, 1520, there's a um, review on the law by the Constitutional Court, and we think that this could be good. Why? Because we've been doing research in Colombia during the 20th century from 1900 to 1980. Only one sentence in the courts speak about public domain, none about exceptions and limitation. The main issue that has been dealt by judge has been payment of copyright. So we have been trying to do some research during the last part of the, from 1980 to now, and still what we found is that there is little litigation about limitation and exception. So probably the bill 1520, if we manage the court to say something substantive, it would be a huge step for us. Anyway, I just wanted to point out something small. When I said this, uh, about one year ago in a meeting or two, in a, we were with the network of limitation and exceptions in Amsterdam. I said, this is great what we are doing, but we need to do it fast because Latin America will start to implement FTAs and it will do it fast track. I did that before Leyeras. I said that. After Leyeras, we know it's going to happen. And if you think Colombia is something funny, just think about Panama. 
they passed the law in three days. Monday, first debate, Tuesday, second debate, third, uh, Wednesday, third debate. And their copyright reform was on. Totally as a one-size-fits-all, you can go into details. So just 2013, we need really to change the public policies in Latin America from an enforcement agenda to a positive agenda. Thank you very much.